Hi Rohit, welcome to Law Sikho, and we are now live. And uh, really welcome today, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to talk today about mooting and how uh, mooting can lead to a great career in litigation and how it helps. How much it helps. We'll talk a lot about mooting and about litigation. Both the things are a hot favorite of all law students. So let's get started. Thank you. So before we, uh, you know, go into anything else, why don't you uh, tell us about yourself a bit? We would like to know about you more before we get into something else. Okay, uh, I'm Rohit Rathi. I am a pass out of ILS Law College, Pune. I'm a pass out of 2013. And I've been practicing ever since. For one year, I was in Nagpur. And uh, I practiced here predominantly at the Nagpur bench of Bombay High Court. And of course, the district courts and other tribunals and lower courts. And I moved to Delhi in 2014. And over the last four years, I've been in Delhi. And uh, these, I mean, at least the first three years in Delhi were a mix of uh, working for about two and a half years with Mr. Apurv Kurup. He's an advocate on record in the Supreme Court. And then I worked with Mr. Maninder Singh, additional solicitor general of India for about six to eight months. And uh, since about uh, last July, July, July 2017, I've been independent. So I'll be completing one year as an independent counsel this July. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So why did you choose litigation? Yeah, why I chose litigation. So uh, the story to this, I think, would uh, date back to my school days. I used okay. to love debating and uh, so I belong to Nagpur, uh, I grew up here, I studied in one school all throughout and uh, unlike most of the schools back then our school had a very 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 active debating culture. Uh, mm. It uh, really helped me uh, understand the prospects of debating, be involved, uh, there, it wasn't formalized to the extent of having a formal uh, debating team which I believe is the trend nowadays amongst most of the schools, if not all. However, mm -hmm. debating was something that was greatly valued, respected by everybody, uh, you know, by students, by faculty alike. And uh, so I used to love debating. And then I remember this one time, I think I would have been in my seventh or eighth grade. And I uh, saw this interview. I think it was of uh, senior advocate and the legend Ram Jait Malani. And uh, I don't remember as of now what the interview exactly was on. As a 12 or a 13 year old teenager, I think I barely understood the content of it. But uh, what I was glued to was the fact that the moment he walked out, I think he had just given bites about for a minute or two, and not even that much, maybe a few seconds. And uh, the way the journalist just swarmed onto him and uh, why every word he said mattered and making notes and just ensuring that it's put like that verbatim on televisions. And that's when I understood the value, the importance of a lawyer. And I think I'll be uh, failing if I don't mention the encouragement that was given to me by my father. I think very early in the day, he did uh, spot that uh, maybe I could do well in law. So he suggested me, I think when we were in seventh or eighth, and I think that was about the time when India Today had become very active, or I think that was the time they initiated this, uh, you know, publishing the best colleges in various streams. Uh, that edition. So he helped me with that really and uh, made me understand about various law colleges and how law as a career is important, can help you and uh, can maybe match my interests, preferences. Also, I sucked that math, I sucked that science. So yeah, I had to do something apart from that. So yeah, law was many people select, you know, the, oh, you are, you are not good at maths, might as well go for law. Like sometimes oh, yeah. like <laughs> that's right. Right. My grandmom, whenever uh, you know, I get to come to Nagpur, she's 82 at the moment, she always tells me uh, that we have a lot of lawyers in the family, but uh, the difference between you and the seniors is this, that they did law because they were doing nothing else. And she says when, you know, at least about say 30 odd years back, that was the thing about law, that Joku Chorni said that person would end up doing law. And she says, thankfully yeah. that has changed and uh, you know, you went in there out of choice. So, yeah. Okay. So, you know, what is the reason that you opted for, uh, you know, uh, litigation specifically in the area that you're doing? Like many, you could even go for, uh, you know, perhaps it's, it's quite a common choice for people to go into, uh, you know, like common law firm at least for some time. And later on, 
maybe they go into uh, litigation so what do you think about that to start litigation right out of law college is it a great idea uh it's actually a very subjective question and i'll answer accordingly if you ask me and uh, because this is actually the thing that i would suggest most of my juniors uh i have always suggested the same to them so i think uh, i'll uh, you know stick to that so uh, i preferred litigation directly because uh, i always knew for a fact that i wanted to be in delhi i was very sure of that and uh, thankfully since uh, i got opportunities to intern during my college days in delhi that made me realize that yes i might as well give this a chance realizing fully well the difficulties and all the problems that i would be facing particularly being a first generation lawyer so uh, the little that i understood then was that i personally wouldn't want to come to delhi as a fresher i was still a fresher because one year at law is practically nothing still i wanted to have some practice some standing or uh, to say the least at least a few people knowing my name before i actually shifted to delhi so my idea and my plan was accordingly this way that uh, i should spend at least about a year or two uh, you know at nagpur and uh, the advantage that nagpur so nagpur basically has uh, you know the bench of bombay high court and uh, the advantage that nagpur particularly gave me was uh, you know being a small place it uh, with the kind of matters that are there it gives you an opportunity to appear before the judges like really soon even at the high court level something that yeah. i have sort of come to a realization of course it can be subjective but still these are the kind of things that do take some time in places like bombay and delhi and i was well aware of that having experienced uh, you know during my internships first hand so what i really wanted was to uh, you know have a chance to appear as as i could and i knew that nagpur could give me an opportunity so that was my plan to work for a year in nagpur uh, learn the basics right importantly and if i can just uh, you know add to this so nagpur as a place has conventional practice and by conventional practice i would mean that the at least at the high court stage the predominant chunk of litigation is to do with service matters wherein essentially government will be a party the state government or the central government depending on the type of the matter uh then there will be your typical criminal matters of course your appeal against convictions appeal against acquittals your 482s that is the poshing and uh, i think when i just joined about say uh, two to three years ago is what i was given to understand there was a little bit of enhancement also in the arbitration and related practice so stricto sensu yes it's still a place that offers you conventional practice and i really wanted to make use of that for my advantage because over here and of what i saw with the amount of efforts that the lawyers would put into their briefs it was a place to really learn your basics right i still don't claim that i know the basics uh, as much as i would want to but still i ventured into that and i figured out that yes this is a kind of a place where i could uh, the place uh, doesn't have the kind of culture that mumbai and delhi have at the moment there are no law firms and even if there are law firms it will be at best two partners who would still be known by their names much more than the law firm not as an entity of course so uh, whenever you work with any senior your uh, prospects of appearing direct interaction these are all magnified some things that you know juniors may take a while uh, you know in uh, other in especially metropolitan cities okay. so yeah coming back to that i decided to start off in nagpur and uh, then after a year i shifted to delhi and uh, as i mentioned earlier i worked at various offices uh whether you should directly opt for litigation after college see one has to consider hundreds and thousands of prospects it's not uh, uh you know it's not a right or a wrong answer there are various ways in which one can go about with this so i think one of the factors also is to do with the kind of responsibilities that are there on you know uh fresh lawyers as uh, you know shoulders like for instance uh, there could be someone who right after practice has to immediately repay his student loan or uh, for that matter has uh, you know an understanding that the parents won't be able to sustain him so starting off in litigation uh, especially if you're not say at mumbai or delhi because the pay cultures you know differ at various places so in view of that there is a strong possibility of someone not wanting to opt for it right after that because financial consideration plays a very major role a very very major role so and i think i fairly state that i was lucky in the sense that i had uh, no added responsibilities and my parents were fully supportive of it knowing fully well that uh, assuming i am able to establish myself it could take years more than you know what a normal person would want 
to give in to a particular career in order to consolidate and uh, maybe establish so yeah these are the concerns that everybody faces then i think also the difference of geography that is the place where you would wish to start also plays a role and of course this is all on the basis of the experience that i've gathered through my friends colleagues at the bar you start off at bombay and of again what i am given to understand what i've learned people prefer starting off in firms because uh, bombay also still has the solicitor culture the solicitor and the lawyer the fine uh, demarcation between the two so starting off in a firm firstly takes care of your financial aspect of it so anybody having a concern to do with that i think starting off in a law firm does make sense however what one also needs to take into consideration at a law firm is that your real on ground exposure that is being in courts is something that's not cut down because it may so happen that you are not going to the court every day you are going as and when your matters are there which is usually not the case in case of counsel practice because of course in counsel practice normally people would have their chambers there or there is always something or the other coming up every day it could be in any court it could be in the high court it could be in tribunals district courts etc so that is something that i think one does have to take into consideration particularly and uh, because uh, of what i have learned understood then i think this also uh, if i'm not mistaken finds a mention in uh, uh, fali nariman's autobiography before memory fades wherein he stated and i still remember that uh, i would go to courts and obviously i didn't have briefs from day one and i would just be going to any court just observing only with the realization that maybe i have to appear before this you know judge sometime later in order to understand in order to understand the various developments in law and of course the fine quality lawyers who argue in these courts it's important to learn as much as from them because uh, in litigation it's impossible to learn everything by yourself you have to observe you may realize certain things from others as matters as to why exactly on that point a particular bench was not big whereas the other bench completely ruled it in their favor on the basis of this point so these are a few considerations that one has to take and there is no exception to your real on field exposure you have to be in court you really really have to be in court because that's how you learn you may not have a matter you may have a matter you may sit after your matter after your bosses matter in your initial days as a junior but it's really important to be there in the courts delhi uh, again of what uh, i am understanding of the culture at the moment there is a culture of pain uh, you know you do get a fairly decent stipend which will be able to cover your expenses so if one is essentially looking to start off maybe in delhi then yes it's not that bad an idea to immediately get into litigation uh, you know starting off with uh, the lawyer of your choice the kind of practice is into the areas of interest matching with yours or there are a lot of councils in delhi who uh, have practice which is so very diversified that you could actually have a lot of exposure with them so in delhi maybe one could start but then again as i mentioned uh, i think financial aspect plays a role Uh, if not a very important at least a very considerable role because one at the end of the day does have to match it accordingly also working in a law firm at least to the point in the litigation sector of course one getting comfortable can also give you problems because in litigation one has to realize your initial days there's going to be practically no money or very limited money and you would be wondering whether it will change but uh, and as i hope things do get better over the period but uh, yes uh, that is something that uh, i have seen again happening to quite a few of my friends that working in a law firm they are extremely talented they are wanting to shift to core litigation but then again the aspect of having to bring your own clientele to get your own briefs again for a first generation lawyer these are the kind of difficulties that uh, you know end up dissuading someone from continuing in litigation or at least jumping to litigation from corporate or from a firm litigation exposure So yeah, these are the factors one could consider. Okay, so uh, you know we already covered this quite a bit, but I wanted to ask you specifically, you know, uh, what, why choose, uh, like, what is the fact, like, how is it different in Bombay and in Delhi? Because when these days a young lawyer is open to relocating, and pretty much you might be starting anywhere. You no, know, it doesn't matter. In Bangalore is also okay. Anywhere you are ready to start. At least that's the thing we are seeing in a lot of lawyers. so if somebody has to choose between delhi and mumbai what are the can you explain the difference in the culture so by the way we have got a couple of question already we will be taking them next uh, but uh, before since you already talked so much about delhi and mumbai i wanted to know specifically about these this this question as well right 
So in Mumbai, I think uh, a consideration that one should have irrespective of where you're from, uh, if not Mumbai, right? See, if you're from Mumbai, you have your folks staying there and you don't really have to bother about finances. Uh, maybe you could directly start off in a proper, you know, I mean, in a lawyer's chambers. Because of what I have understood, the pay culture, particularly in Maharashtra, doesn't, uh, you know, revolve around a particular stipend. Your stipend might just be nominal. Uh, you know, you might just be getting that and... Uh, uh, that may or may not be enough to even cover for a few of your restaurant bills. You know. However, the uh, the very positive part of uh, you know the work culture, the pay culture in uh, Maharashtra, and I'm sure Mumbai is included in this, is that uh, once you join uh, you know particular chambers, and uh, your boss has a considerable practice, uh, maybe a decade, maybe you know a little more. There's no rule of thumb, but depending upon how uh, you know well he is established, the culture is to directly mark briefs to the juniors. And that's a very, very, very healthy trend that has continued even today. So I think the answer to the first question wherein I mentioned about the work culture in Nagpur, again, that's the advantage we got because we were immediately marked briefs. And uh, that gave us a lot of sense of responsibility. Uh, there was a lot of honor that this brief is yours, this client is yours. We have to deal with him from day one. And uh, as a fresh uh, law graduate, believe me, no matter how much we, have, we how much ever we would have learned, uh, these are at best only sprinklers that can help you to enhance your experience. Your real learning actually begins from day one you join a chamber, a firm, you know, depending on your preference. So <clears throat> uh, that's the culture. You know, you are you are marked a brief directly, and uh, because of that, what happens is that invariably you start making some money out of it, right? If at all finances are that big a consideration, if finance is just not a consideration, I think a person very much interested in litigation, very much interested in actually being in courts the whole time round. Yes, I think a person should ideally be joining chambers because a firm practice is very, very, very diversified. There are multiple number of people. They have their own specializations. And again, of what I'm given to understand is that uh, you are segmented into various departments, right? So depending upon your department, you are going to be marked briefs accordingly. So say a person who's there in indirect taxation of a particular law firm, may end up not knowing anything about crimes right and uh, if a person has been so very particular right from his law school days that no there's all that i want to do and uh, though it doesn't quite happen but still if a person has been that focused that this is what i see myself doing for the rest of my life maybe working in a particular department of a law firm is a very good idea however to be able to gain an all-round exposure have direct interaction with the clients have a lot of on-ground experience yes you have to be working in a lawyer's chambers for the uh, sheer difference in the logistics of the same, right? There's just that one person who works in a law firm. There are going to be multiple people. There are various, uh, you know, stages at which you are accordingly promoted in a law firm. So your roles and responsibilities differ is what I would say. That's, I think, and I don't think I'm mistaken into that. That's predominantly how the culture in Maharashtra, Mumbai also is. So if you're working in the chambers, maybe your boss, maybe your senior will not pay you something directly. However, with the briefs that you are marked, yes, you'll be able to take care of the finance part. And then, of course, you know, the rest is what you do. In Delhi, and again, of what I have seen, particularly if you're working with an advocate on record, yes, you're going to be paid. You're going to be paid something. It could vary with the advocate on record, uh, his standing, his expertise, etc. But yes, you're going to have, because the stipend culture is very much still there in Delhi. Now, coming to the second part of uh, your question as to what the young law graduates should do, uh, you know, who are open to relocating, who are open to moving. Now, I think this question has to be looked at from a very holistic perspective. It's uh, uh, not something you could just decide in a day or in two days. So say, for instance, if you're someone who is not originally from Mumbai or Delhi, like I don't happen to be from these two cities, or say from any other metro where uh, you wanted to work, where there's a concentration of law firms. So <clears throat> like I belong to Nagpur. I too had this choice. I had to make that choice, uh, whether Mumbai or Delhi. So I think one of the major reasons I chose Delhi, apart from the internship experiences and other experiences that I've had in Delhi, was the fact that I knew that from Nagpur, I could get maybe, maybe someday at some level, some briefs to Delhi. There could be, you know, advocates interested in me because I'm in Delhi and they have matters to send to in Delhi. You know, of course, you don't win all your matters at any stage. So whether there is anything that needs to be sent to Delhi, some references, etc. So that was my thought process. And I also uh, was of the opinion that if I have to live away from my parents, from uh, you know, away from Nagpur, from my hometown, I might as well be at the place where uh, you know majority of the courts are there, and that undoubtedly in India is Delhi. 
my personal areas of interest are educational constitutional and service so i'm not one of those i do uh, practice also at nclt a bit yet i'm not at a personal level that very fond or i haven't had uh, uh, that much of you know whatever little expertise i have gathered up until now in commercial matters so that was another factor that helped me decide that uh, you know i could still be in delhi so uh, the attraction of supreme court which i think all the law students also have particularly that now talking about mumbai and again somebody who's not from mumbai there is actually a big time difference between the rent scales of mumbai and the delhi that's one thing that uh, i think you know a law student should particularly try understanding of course i am uh, generalizing it taking into account an average law student who comes from a kind of background where a person does have to think of all these parameters before shifting before relocating etc right i'm not talking about those for whom it's all uh, uh, you know sorted or for that matter they have worked it out in some way or the other the logistics the finances etc now you don't happen to be from mumbai and uh, you join a lawyers as chambers the first factor you obviously will have to consider is being able to cover for your expenses right you have to have the dogged determination in order to be able to survive with practically no money if you happen to be someone whose parents at the moment can't afford to sustain you uh, there's no other way i can put it right that's going to be one factor to consider second and i think that's something again that law students need to very particularly uh, you know take into consideration so first that one, just to, i wanted to understand this on the first point that you said so what is better delhi or bombay like if i don't have finances my parents can't give me money i have to save like you know i have to survive myself then delhi or bombay which is my choice if i have to go for litigation uh i think on the top of yeah on the top of my head i think i would uh, think of delhi uh, for the very simple reason that you're going to get some money right you are going to be able to but this i'm very particularly talking about uh, you know uh, law students interested in subsequently joining council practice that is chambers and not law firms because law firms do pay yeah that is right that that is clear yeah that's it so yes delhi initially you know i mean any chambers is going to pay you uh, it may differ but yes they are going to pay you another factor delhi the rent scales are lot lesser as compared to mumbai so uh, you know with the kind of places to stay in delhi yeah, yeah. yeah. Ramanesh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. Please go. Should I continue? Continue, continue. Yeah. Okay. So about Mumbai, like of what I've seen again with my friends, and you know, formerly when I had interned in Mumbai, uh, you know, of what I had heard, uh, the rent scales are obviously skyrocketing. That's a purely vertical city. So it's just stories and stories that are added, if uh, you know, I put it uh, very generally. Uh, whereas Delhi, uh, the rent scales are different. Uh, they are really different, and uh, with the kind of money that is being paid initially, yes, Delhi is a kind of place where one could survive. One could definitely survive. Yes, that's something that I could, uh, you know, just put to anybody who's interested in joining litigation that Delhi will help you survive. And uh, of course, I'm not saying that uh, in Mumbai you can't. You have to chalk out that kind of a deal. It depends upon the kind of senior you get. But let's be fair and let's understand that, irrespective of the kind of Uh, you know packages you would be getting in respect of the kind of stipends or money you would be making in mumbai rent scales are going to be uh, you know pinching at least in your initial days parents going so that's so one thing we ignore the rent and everything then what are right. the other factors right the second aspect is what i was coming to the second aspect one needs to also consider is that this is a kind of profession wherein if a person intends to actually get into independent practice <clears throat> you have to rely on only one person and that's your own self parents where there's no other person who's going to help you out of course there are going to be seniors to guide you your colleagues to help you out uh, your parents to help you tide over difficulties but essentially in order to get briefs at least for a first generation lawyer believe me it's not an easy task and uh, my intention is definitely not to demotivate discourage either of you but yes let's be realistic about things so and in fact this happens to be one of the uh, principal worries that dissuades a lot of young and you know immensely talented students right after law from getting into litigation and then eventually maybe because you may be able to do work that's fine you will be the best at your job but it doesn't just start with getting briefs it also also starts i'm sorry uh, with working on briefs it also starts with getting briefs making your own clientele for which there's no answer there's no particular source you just have to make a clientele on the basis of 
uh, you know, whatever you do, how much ever you socialize, uh, your networking, advertising being prohibited, that's another big embargo. So uh, that's a factor. So in Delhi, and again, of what I have seen, um, Supreme Court particularly, there are lawyers from all the states. And a lot of them are doing phenomenally well in various age brackets. These are the kind of lawyers, uh, you know, particularly the advocates on record. Again, I'm not generalizing, but then again, of what I've seen, they draw a lot of their briefs from their parent high courts. Like somebody could be from Bangalore, somebody could be from Hyderabad, somebody could also be from Mumbai, or somebody could be from a place uh, in Orissa where there's not a high court. Yet you happen to have some connection with, uh, you know, the Orissa high court. So the advocates on record in Delhi essentially get their briefs from their parent state or their parent high court as, uh, you know, we call it there. <clears throat> so that's one kind of advantage that Delhi gives you, no matter where you're from. If uh, you happen to be blessed uh, to happen to be from a place where there's a high court or even a bench for that matter, like Nagpur doesn't have a principal seat. We have a bench of the Bombay bench of, of the Bombay bench. So uh, that is something, you know, I was initially marked briefs from uh, Nagpur that did help me, that did help me tied over, uh, you know, a lot of things, that initial confidence that you need as a lawyer. Whereas in Mumbai, if you look at it only from the point of view of Bombay High Court, the jurisdiction is going to be obviously Bombay, the surrounding districts and a few more districts, Pune and otherwise. Now to be able to get matters from there, of course, these are the kind of things that you have to worry about only once, you know, you pass out, but still, these are valid considerations. So for a lot of students, uh, for a lot of uh, fresh graduates, this may be a consideration as to how try building a personal practice in Mumbai. You are in a law firm, it's fine. You work there for about 10, 15 years. You are able to make good contacts for yourself. You leave. It's an entirely different matter because by then people would have saved. And there are examples like these also. However, for a person wanting to be in litigation from day one, yes, this could be a very valid source of consideration as to where even try getting your first briefs from. Right, first brief from. So yeah, these are the factors that one needs to consider in Delhi, uh, being the place where the Supreme Court is located, also being the place where all the appellate tribunals invariably are located, electricity, company law, a green, etc. Green tribunal doesn't have an appellate bench, irrespective. So <clears throat> these are the places where a lot of works come from a person's a person's parent state. And that helps, you know, that helps you big time. So yeah, I think this is a consideration one needs to have. So if if uh, so, you know, like we frequently hear that uh, people to saying that you know Bombay High Court is an excellent place to start practice because there's so many companies and a lot of commercial hubs. So it is like a great place to earn money in the long term. So do you say there okay. are some advantages of the Bombay High Court also? Uh, the advantages of the Bombay High Court, if uh, I could start with, I mean, there are endless. I think the best lawyers even today in India at one point of time were known as lawyers from Bombay. Some of the best lawyers, if not all, definitely. Uh, so they all started from Bombay. Each one of them, needless to say, had their own advantages and disadvantages. Yet they all started from Bombay. Some shifted immediately, some after a few years. Again, I would like to quote from Before Memory Fades where Fari Nariman writes, uh, and I'm just paraphrasing the same way. He says that... Uh, Nowadays, I'm seeing a trend amongst a lot of lawyers to, uh, you know, immediately start practice in Supreme Court. And while he relates that to his own experience, he says that forget practicing in Supreme Court. I hadn't even seen the Supreme Court building for the first 15 years of my career. And we're talking about, I think, one of the greatest lawyers ever. So, yeah, this is the kind of difference you feel now. You see there's, there's now. And coming straight to your question that there are a lot of companies, so it's a good place to make money in the longer run. Again, for someone who's interested in financial matters, and if I may add, only in financial matters, yes, maybe Bombay might be the ultimate place to be. At. But for someone who's interested in having an exposure into, uh, you know, various other fields, uh, could be criminal, uh, uh, could be a service, could be pure civil. Again, you could make a choice between Bombay and Delhi. Uh, it depends again on the factors that I enlisted before. Bombay as a place has a phenomenal culture in terms of uh, uh, the seniors, uh, you know, who had set up the culture there in the sense, uh, like, uh, I think uh, uh, I read it in MC Chagla's book. And for all the law students who haven't yet read uh, Roses in December, I think we should do that today. Uh, it's, I think, one of those books that I would recommend each and every law student to read, uh, you know, in your five years. So Roses in December, in which he writes, that Bombay High Court has had a kind of culture of, uh, you know, informal say, in the sense that the youngest member at the bar would address the senior most member at the bar, not as sir, but, you know, by his first name. I don't know to what extent it is even today. 
but the apparent understanding seems to be that that's how free one is supposed to be with anybody in Bombay. You want help, you directly approach someone, he helps you, he guides you. Because needless to say, this is a kind of profession wherein you nurture, uh, you learn, uh, you invite the most from your senior. And your senior plays a very, very, very crucial role in shaping uh, not just your career, but also in shaping your personality as a lawyer. Uh, you know, at times I also hear this thing being said that uh, he's become so much like his senior. And I think that's true because of the kind of long hours that, uh, you know, all of us lawyers have to put into, uh, you know, uh, practice into, uh, you know, uh, office. You invariably imbibe a lot of things from your senior. Like I personally at my level uh, today can say that there's so much that I've just learned from my seniors. Uh, you know, particularly Mr. Apoor, with uh, whom I have spent uh, the longest amount of time. So uh, your way of working, your research, you know, uh, develops accordingly. Now, uh, as far as the money part is concerned, see, you're working in a law firm, you're in Mumbai, you're in Delhi, uh, in litigation, maybe the pay scales could differ, but I don't know to what extent that difference is going to be there. It may be there, it may not be there, but a lot of it gets eventually covered in your rent and other aspects, which uh, you know, is obviously a concern for uh, uh, any uh, you know, young lawyer. However, looking at it from a long term perspective and thinking of it only from the point of view of money, I don't think it's the wisest of decisions, right? Money eventually, uh, you know, if you're serious about what you do, what you, uh, you know, put into practice, one makes, uh, you know, the kind, uh, uh, the, uh, the degree will differ. But needless to say, one does make money out of it. Now, just because Bombay eventually pays you well, I don't think should be a consideration voting someone to be in Bombay. You be in Bombay because you are in love with financial matters. Maybe you are in love with the city. Maybe you particularly like the, uh, you know, the work exposure, the work culture in Bombay. And these are the kind of considerations that I think a law student should have, apart from the others, that in your various internships that you, uh, you know, uh, should hopefully have at places, you know, Bombay, Delhi, otherwise, these are the things that help you decide eventually where you could stay. A lot of people want to be in Bombay for the sheer love of the city. A lot of people want to be in Delhi for similar reasons. So, yes, and these are as valid considerations as you could think of. Now, how high does one go in the profession is not something that you can answer when you are in your 20s, 30s, or even 40s for that matter. Because I don't think there's a profession as dynamic as this. And uh, no matter what you age, there is still tons and tons for you to learn. And there's still so much that you don't know. So more than the pay scales and the money, apart from your initial days, of course, I think you should look at what exactly you want to do. So one thing that I really took away from what you said now, you know, is that you must consider, uh, you know, what you love doing. So if if you want to practice, let's say, shipping law, or you want to practice, you know, uh, you know, you want to do savvy matters, you know, you want to do financial matters, maybe derivatives, structuring, structured finance. These kind of things happen only in Bombay, like mostly in Bombay. Of course, things yeah. can go in to the Supreme Court, but. If your heart lies there and you want to really do commercial, hardcore financial, commercial, securities law kind of things or shipping law, number of things, Bombay is the hub. So I think that's a great reason to choose Bombay. That's and if you want, yeah, and if you want to do like, you know, you want to be in the Supreme Court, you want to do regulatory matters, you know, where you, know, you want to do Aptel or electricity or whatever. I think those are the things where you have to make a choice for Delhi. I think that's a bigger consideration in the long term. Besides, so incidentally, I know we got carried away in this conversation and we we did not even talk about looting at all while we have the looting in our title so far. Okay, so let's let's kind of get back. And I want to first thing I want to ask you is tell us a little about your uh, mooting achievements from college so that our uh, you know viewers know what what you know what if they should take how seriously they should take it. That's right. Tell uh, if you talk of accolades and uh, uh, yeah, it uh, might seem boastful, but okay. So right, I, I'll just, uh, you know, start with uh, uh, something about my alma mater, ILS Law College, Pune. Uh, there yeah, are... I, just, I just want to say one thing before you go any further is that you have been so humble throughout this session that if you talk about your accolades, I think it will kind of balance it out. Nobody will find it at all boastful. <laughs> I think I stand obliged. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in our college in ILS Pune, uh, mood culture is really, really good. Uh, it's, uh, I think, one of the best and, uh, okay, blame it on the bit of the prejudice, I think it's the best in the country. And I'll just uh, you know, enumerate the reasons for that. One, uh, there are, at any point of time at ILS Pune, 
about eight batches of students, right? So five belonging to the five-year course and three belonging to the three-year course. And uh, there are about 250 to 300 odd students in each and every batch. So in total, you could say there are at least about 2,000 to 2,200 students at any point of time pursuing only and only law at ILS Law College Pune, right? And uh, for us, our college, uh, uh, you know, had that policy, and I think they still do, that uh, national moots or international moots are not allowed to be, uh, you know, participated in by first years, first years either of the five-year course or of the three-year course. And uh, I think the reason is fair for that. Uh, uh, one of them being that you are actually, uh, you know, too lay, uh, you know, as a person, uh, as a law student for that matter. And I think that's uh, pretty much the reason. By the time you're into your second year, your exposure also to law subjects and all begins. So I believe that was what was behind this particular policy. So in our second year, we had this intra-college uh, moot court competition for uh, national moot courts, for uh, you know, domestic moot courts. Uh, it was called FUDNIS. And uh, uh, there were at least about 400 to 500 odd participants in uh, you know various rounds of this intra ILS moot court competition. So we would be divided into a batch of 15 odd students in close to 15 uh, you know courtrooms that would be doing two sessions for two days straight, and then there would be the finals. So effectively, from about 400 odd students who would be participating in the moot, there would only be say 10 to 12 who would have made it to the finals. And then on the basis of your ranking, you would be allotted moots, right? So uh, the toppers were given a chance to do BCI. Uh, then there was Luthra. Uh, then there was uh, Herbert Smith, etc., uh, etc., et which you could choose accordingly. You could always have your own partner. Uh, you know, you could choose your moot partner accordingly. That wasn't a concern. This was to do with the domestic uh, moots. And for international moots, there was a separate competition. The participants, I believe, were lesser, not to take away any credit from anybody who's participated because excelling at international uh, you know law moots is as difficult so uh, so from out of 400 odd students if uh, you know depending upon your rank you could opt for the moots and that was something that actually put us to a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, rigor and uh, competitive advantage because when already your uh, intra collegiate moot court you'd have to work so hard then invariably that is something you tend to do in your you know other moot courts you don't get lackadaisical because you realize how much efforts did you have to put in at least to get that far and then eventually you have to do it for your national moot as well so in my second year uh, uh, again uh, i was uh, i participated i was through to the finals in my second year and uh, me along with another uh, batchmate a very dear friend of mine uh, we both were the finalists, so we both opted for ULC Bangalore, University Law College Bangalore, their national moot court. And uh, uh, so their pattern of framing the moot problem would be the current, uh, you know, happening, the most uh, visible happening in Karnataka for that particular session, you know, for that particular year. So when we went, it was to do with illegal mining, right? And uh, the year before that was again illegal mining. And the year right after that was to do with the defection laws, because if you uh, people recollect, uh, I think in 2010, that was the pressing issue in Karnataka. So uh, not to diverge, I did ULC Bangalore. Uh, we won. Uh, we are really happy about that. Uh, and I think it uh, benefited me immensely because uh, something, again, that I haven't quite seen anywhere else. And I just, just, just got lucky. The winning award in ULC Bangalore was a month-long internship with uh, Mr. Soli J. Swarajji. So, uh, you know, all the efforts, all the hard work that we pitched in, it just paid out uh, because, you know, the amount of satisfaction you get after that, uh, it's, it's amazing. And uh, coupled with this internship just turned out to be, you know, a big, big, big uh, bonus. In my third year, I participated in Surana Trial Advocacy. Uh, it's organized by Nuals Kochi. At that point of time, I think it was the only trial law moot court in the country. And uh, oh, so, <laughs> long back when I was in my second year, I did that moot, I remember. It was in Kochi. That was in Kochi. Yeah, that's right. So, 1390, yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, that was the only moot on trial advocacy, and uh, there were actually witnesses. And, uh, you know, we were made to cross examine the witnesses. So, that was, I think, the, uh, you know, the best part about that particular moot court. It actually uh, created a courtroom scenario uh, as realistic as it could be because moot courts particularly uh, uh, you know they are very appellate oriented i think the law students will agree with me they are essentially appellate style right you could be in the high court you could be in the supreme court even a law court for that matter but essentially uh, you know you would only be at best if in law court presenting your closing arguments and in high courts it will be or supreme court it is particular you know the appellate style of uh, you know arguments 
this moot court surana trial advocacy helped us develop also uh, you know the cross examination and other intricacies involved uh, again by god's grace we won that moot court and uh, uh, what one thing i would yeah no nobody wins a moot just because of god's grace you <laughs> <laughs> just blessed with a very good team <laughs> and uh, yeah one thing i would like to add here uh, i was so impressed by this particular moot that right after surana trial advocacy me and the group of friends who had attended we started in ils pune you know the ils intra college ua trial advocacy uh, that's running up until now and i particularly wanted an intra college event because uh, uh, each team would have four participants and this is a kind of moot court you know where there are going to be two teams at the same point of time arguing battling it out with each other unlike a conventional moot court where in one goes and thereafter the other goes for a battle right so that was something i really wanted to invite so uh, assuming there would be say 30 or teams to participate would 120 150 students could participate in you know something that's so very realistic and so very much needful and uh, then in my uh, fourth year i participated in kk luthra moot court it happens in delhi clc uh, you know new delhi organizes that uh, we were ranked as uh, runners up uh, the best part if i can just share this little experience with you was uh, we were up against pakistan college of law in our or uh, i don't remember the college right now but we were up against pakistan in our semis and uh, we were through to the finals obviously defeating pakistan so yeah it gave me a lot more patriotic boost as well apart from anything else and uh, yeah it was an international event needless to say so there were participants from various other countries yeah that's about my mooting experience in fifth year i was very clear i'm not going to moot and just going to enjoy and you know chill in college <laughs> that's a good idea even in my fifth year i didn't want to moot and what happened that a team dropped out and suddenly i had to fill in for some one nls arbitration oh. <laughs> think, here you shouldn't be mooting you should let it let the kids enjoy you know? exactly thankfully we don't have that in common huh? <laughs> okay so uh, you know uh, <clears throat> something i want to ask you at this point is that you know how did you prepare for your moots what actually goes into winning a moot if you can tell us that like you know uh, <clears throat> the preparation give us some idea about the preparation how did you start from the time the problem released did you start preparing even before the problem released you know what did you do like to prepare for a moot and what goes into winning a moot right so at least for my intra college at moot uh, we would have various problems of uh, diversified fields you would have a problem on constitution one on criminal one on intellectual property or taxation so in my second third and fourth year because each year we had to participate your ranks did not uh, you know uh, help you for the subsequent year definitely so i was sure of the fact that i'm going to uh, you know Uh, practice uh, not practice i'm going to participate in various uh, you know problems i'm not going to confine myself only to constitution or criminal so i think yes one needs to diversify one needs to have a hang of various problems that are available assuming that's also something that happens in your college but i know for a fact that all the colleges in india definitely offer a variety and that's something that one should stick to uh, second uh, of course i didn't start preparing any time before because that wasn't possible uh, you know anything that you could do would just be to do with your general reading or your subject reading for exams Uh, nothing beyond uh yes i would start you know, definitely start preparing much earlier you know they have to like kind of start reading up on international law in a big way right. even that's before right. that's, right. that's the yes. common thing actually. that's something i did for my national moots of course definitely because uh, knowing well that ulc bangalore would have a problem on constitutional law so i think being a second year uh, we just started to brush up our concepts because uh, to us constitutional law was taught only in our third year uh, as a subject so needless to say we have to start uh, preparation for that yes i would start with that uh, again for kk luthra but the advantage of kk luthra was that the problem would be released at least 6 months in advance and uh, we guys were very particular that we are going to start working from day one and that is i think again if uh, you know it can be uh, given as a pointer from me yes start working on your moot problem at least for a national moot problem from the day you get it in your hands the day you know that you have a problem you may not uh, you know leave everything else aside for that depending upon you know your other work commitments of course which are also huge in a law school i fairly understand however start working start putting in something into that maybe if nothing else at least just uh, you know i don't know if i should be advising uh, you guys about this but the kind of i mean the lecture that you don't quite enjoy you know during your lecture hours just carry your mood problem and uh, just pretend to be engrossed in the subject while you are actually reading your mood problem you could do something to that effect yes i have done that and uh, so be in You should convert your unproductive times into some productive use. Precisely, that's precisely. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're not being productive, at least you know that's yes. the kind of that's the time to start preparing for your mood. I think. Yes. 
definitely that's one to be the master of facts your uh, uh, mood code problem might be a pager it might be two pages it could end up into 20 pages you actually be need to be on the top of facts each one of you irrespective of whether you are the speaker or you're the researcher be on the top of facts because at the end of it what you will realize is that uh, mooting has a lot of variables mooting has a lot of contingencies depending upon where were you placed uh, you know in the order of uh, teams uh, for that particular national moot depending upon what is the mindset of that particular judge because at the end of the day essentially in all the moot courts they would be practicing lawyers so you do need to understand something that as much as they would try uh, you know uh, uh, try isolating their college and their experiences in college from real life that doesn't happen right at times a judge might just expect you to look at him her straight in the eyes and you know just inform him the facts just state the facts and uh, sometimes a judge might just end up brushing aside the facts and will directly jump to the law and uh, it may so happen that the judge may not know the facts that well and that is when you can always intervene and say that in order to understand this particular contention argument let me take you back to the facts again again just by way of an example be the master of facts of course that's quite common actually like judges very often don't know the facts and sometimes not even the law in moot courts sure. That's true. That. that does happen. And one really has to be prepared for that. Arbitration and they have gotten me to judge it. Yeah. I don't know it. Like So that, that happens, but quite frequently because you don't find a lot of specialized judges, right. sorry, specialized you know, lawyers to judge in a moot. So you have, you call whoever, whoever has a mooting credential and then Definitely. they actually judge the law. Like I have faced that quite a few times myself. Like, you know, one at one, in one case there was like, we are, like let's take NLS arbitration. If the subject matter was some derivative contracts right. and it was English law and the judges who were attending, they were great lawyers, by the way, right. uh, in semi-finals, but they actually didn't know the uh, <laughs> law so well. They haven't read it before and we were the first people to inform them about the law. So that's a very tricky situation when the judge doesn't know it because you, because um, rookie mooters tend to assume that the judge will know the law, right? Uh, Rohit, are you there? Rohit, we have lost you. Rohit, are you there? Uh, Rohit, there is a... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I can hear you. I couldn't hear you in the middle. Can you continue? Yeah, please continue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you are absolutely right when you said that uh, it does happen a lot of times that the judges are not aware of the subject matter. They are not aware of the facts. Uh, maybe the judge will not give you enough time to be able to narrate all the facts. So that is when you really need to be able to concise. Uh, that is something uh, you really need to understand because that's how practical life works. In real courts, nobody is going to give you like five minutes particularly okay. Uh, uh, counsel, just go ahead with your facts. No, that doesn't happen. You're supposed to know the gist of it. You're directly supposed to, uh, you know, hit the point and you're supposed to start it off from there. So that is something one needs to take into consideration. Particularly, you need to be on the top of facts. And of course, things like I, something that I always did. So in my Sudana trial, I go problem technology behind it as to how exactly these barcodes work right so our entire team i made it a point achha, uh, if i can just uh, you know be a bit off tangent choosing your moot partner is much more important than choosing the person with whom you would want to have a relationship with subject to consent of course but yes that's i think one of the most important decisions you need to take you need to have a person with whom your frequency matches with whom you understand the kind of hours that need to be pitched in and a lot of friendships also turn sour only because of the fact that okay you, know, yeah. you realize that you were just not meant to uh, you know be working on moods together don't let that happen be very careful as far as is possible work with a kind of person who can trust your Uh, we went to big bus uh, 
quite frankly, it does under technology behind barcodes. And I remember that particularly because in our finals, we were judged, I think, by sitting judges of Kerala High Court. And there was this one particular aspect which I could, uh, you know, justify, which I could define from my opponents better only because of the fact that I knew the practical working on it. Right. So this is something that I've always done. Again, in my fourth year for KK Luthera, uh, uh, the problem was something to do with, uh, you know, industrial hazard and industry accident. Uh, there were cylinders and some other things involved. Of course, the key issue was to do with manslaughter, but then again, we had to understand the working of an industry. So, for the purpose of that, we arranged for an interview. These were things that I don't think I'm wrong when I say that only our team knew, because we were the ones who took efforts to try to get into the practical insight of it. And I think in this, I'm uh, uh, blessed with an example of uh, someone's interview. I don't remember whose interview I read, but there was someone who was, uh, you know, asked to quote an anecdote on uh, the great Mr. Harish Salve. And he said that the advantage of working with someone like Mr. Salve is this. I think, yeah, it was someone from Reliance Industries who said that. That while he argued the Reliance uh, case between the two brothers, of course, he made it a point to schedule half a day only to visit a particular industry or the factory to understand the working of, uh, you know, refinery. And again, because that is something you have to put it to the judges in few of those simple sentences, which a law expert and otherwise a layman can understand, right? So this is something I think all of you should take into consideration. Try getting into the practical side of it. Otherwise, when it comes to your research, most of the students are obviously aware of the Iraq, and that's how we would approach. And uh, I think everybody would know the kind of resources that are available. The important part is just to stick to them, just to make the most of them. Try not leaving any part of it, uh, you know, unattended. Like I always have this uh, underlying philosophy that each day, whenever I would sit to work on a national moot, or even for that matter, our intra-collegiate moot, I would read my moot problem from start to bottom, and that's how I could manage to, you know, be on the top of the facts. When ultimately I was there at the podium in front of judges, right? Be on top of facts. Try getting some practical insight into it. The resources is something that all of you are very well aware of. Uh, needless to say, there can never ever be a debate upon whether Manupatra is better or SEC or Westlaw or Lexus. No, they are all there. They are all catered to different fields, and you have to decide for yourself as to what helps you in what manner. So, yeah, that's something you need to take into consideration. So, as a passionate mooter, I know that you can go on talking about how to prepare for mooting for a very long time. That's true. Transport <laughs> we are running out of time, you know, and uh, we are at we have just about. Six minutes left, and we have a bunch of questions to answer that Moon many have asked. But what is the most important thing I take away from what you said just now is that you know being thorough with facts and being thorough with the law, and most importantly, leaving nothing like there should be no surprises. You have you should explore every angle of the law that may be relevant, and I think that's the most critical thing that you know that connects you to also a real life case. You know that's pretty much what you do when you have a case or. Even if you're not, not litigation, even when you are dealing with the drafting of high value contract or anything for that matter, being thorough is like one of the key things. So if you can tell about how your mooting experience helped you in your litigation career or did it, did it help at all for that matter? Yes, definitely it helped and I'm glad you brought this question. Uh, it definitely helped. Uh, a very personal reason would be, of course, the internship with Soli J. Sorabji. And I don't think in this one life I can ever get over that. Uh, second, of course, I can't be generalizing this. The kind of efforts uh, we would put into the mood courts at times, I've realized maybe we are actually not pitching in as much in real life, right? So in mood courts, yes, we worked really hard. And that is something that has helped me so much immensely because let's face it, the research techniques pretty much remain the same, of course. Over here in real life, everything normally would begin from a client, uh, you know, uh, counseling session. But of course, the things, the tools are pretty much going to be the same. And one aspect I think I would like to underscore uh, predominantly is that in my mood quotes, I always had this habit of preparing a list of questions that could possibly be shot to me by the bench. And I would always prepare answers for them. Same is what I do even today. And that is one of those things that I have learned, particularly from my senior Mr. Apoorv Guru, that always and always prepare yourself for the kind of questions that the bench may ask you. In real life, these are the kind of answers, at least on the factual part of it, which is something you will get only from your clients. So always be in touch with your clients. Always try getting the most out of them. Engage them. 
immensely well to ensure that they are not hiding anything from you. And that is what I think Ramanuj said, don't be in for any sort of surprises. And a questionnaire in a mood code definitely helps that if a particular judge asks, see, judges come from various philosophies, right? Someone might be very particular about some particular part of the mood problem. Some might, might be particular about something else. The judges may also ask you something just not connected with the mood problem. And that is where you need to realize that apart from your general reading, which can never ever be enough for any law student or a lawyer, it's also important to just possibly gauge as to or predict what can be asked from the bench. And you should be immediately ready with the answer. Because at that point of time, if you are seen scrolling through your memorials and in real life just going through your briefs, no, that doesn't really give a good impression. There you lose points, here you lose the matter or the client. That's what so, you should then, Of course, you know, I'm, I'm going to cut you short with because we're running out of time and there are a bunch of questions we need to answer. So uh, one thing I just want to add here as a word of caution is that Yes, there are good habits and good practices that you can pick up from mooting experience and it kind of gets you started in a direction. But do not expect like mooting to be like uh, the, the, you know, like the life, the actual real life litigation. There is a huge difference and like uh, what, you know, Rohit has already addressed that you start on day one, like as if you have not never done anything in your life and you start learning from a whole new world from scratch, right? Is that correct, Rohit? That's true. Precisely. Yeah. So, so with that, I think we can leave it, leave this question at that because you don't have time with that word of caution. Uh, let's see the questions. We have a question from Yash Agarwal. Yes. Uh, Yash Agarwal is asking, as we all know that moot court is important for litigation, is it really important when it comes to pursuing corporate law? What would you say? Uh, hi, Ash. Uh, uh, yes, just answering your question, don't be that very rigid in your head that moot court helps only a litigator or only in litigation. An average law student should also know something about company law and the best corporate lawyer has to know the basics of the constitution. And this is something you have to keep it in your head, right? So uh, th th there's nothing hard and fast that it doesn't help corporate. See, with mooting, and I think I missed out while I was uh, you know, answering the questions about mooting, it helps most of us reduce our stage fright. And stage fright necessarily doesn't just accrue to you when you are at the podium. It can just happen to while you are drafting a particular agreement, while you're giving a presentation in a law firm to your boss, while you are in an arbitration. So importantly, the moot courts help you eliminate the stage fright that is there in you as to how do I begin? How will I begin? Something like when we are right there, you know, trying to uh, answer our examination papers, the question paper, a lot of us do have this tendency of, you know, seeing our hands trembling, at least in the first few seconds. And that is something that mooting helps you conquer. Because importantly, your stage fright, your, uh, you know, your, your inhibition is just gone. And of course, the added advantage of research, which I think helps a corporate lawyer in as much measure as a litigation lawyer. So don't just be in this zone thinking that litigation only and only helps, uh, you know, mooting helps only the people in the domain of litigation. No, it helps everybody. The intensity and the degree may differ, but yes, it does. So I want to add something. I want to just add from my experience that honestly speaking, it mooting doesn't help you that greatly. Like It's like a small step towards either litigation and corporate law. And both cases, it helps equally. Like it's not going to help you enormously in either case. Definitely, definitely. And so whatever it helps in litigation, at least equal, it helps in corporate in law. Corporate, also. exactly. And uh, similarly, on the same plane, I don't think anybody who's very sure of the to negotiation to everything because the experience is ultimately only a stepping stone. The number of moves you win, the number of events you lose, trust me, it matters that in your life. We have lost Rohit. Rohit, can you hear us? Rohit, are you there? There's some. Yeah, I think can there's you some hear me? Your voice is cracking. Maybe, I mean, I don't know. There's some problem with the signal. 
anyway i'll go to the next question how did you go about your mood prep we have discussed this already thanks rebecca for the question i couldn't make question am i audible now yeah i'm there very much there you know your voice is cracking i can't hear you clearly okay uh, there is some problem with the internet i'm sorry rohit, rohit can you do something can you switch off your video switch off your video maybe we can hear only your audio maybe that will work better i can hear you now yeah yeah it's better hello rohit okay. am i audible hello okay. i can't hear you actually yeah lot better yeah 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 okay okay yeah, it's lot better can you hear me yeah hello yeah so i'm asking a question mohit garg is asking is mooting really important for litigation as in last session chetan priyadarshi sir said that mooting is not really important for litigation or is it totally different okay so i think you know what chetan was saying was not that mooting is not important but you are saying that mooting will help you only limited there are other things you can do like you know practical things you can do in your life uh, you know real life stuff that you can do like for example actually going to the court and helping out an in- indigent person or helping out a senior or doing like even being a paralegal for a lawyer will go a long way compared to mooting but yes mooting is a good experience and even if it doesn't help you at all in future i think just for the sake of how great an experience it is in law school you should do it okay so i have another question here i understand that we learn each day although uh, just a second i understand that we learn each day although how different it is to appear in a real court versus moot court sarjana is asking this question so uh, mohit am i audible are you able to hear us Mohit, are you there? Okay, we have lost Mohit completely. So I think I'll just continue answer this question, and I will end the session here. So, uh, so honestly speaking, appearing in a real court is completely different from appearing in a moot court competition. Like it could not be any more different. It is so different, right? So, uh, just like you know, you'd uh, kind of uh, what can I say? Like. Uh, it's like if you are playing you know you, let's say you are flying an aeroplane and you are you are experiencing flying an aeroplane in a simulator like you know you are sitting in a screen and trying to you know like maybe you are playing a video game when you are driving a car and then you actually drive a car these are completely different experiences just because you have been driving a lot of cars and playing racing games on your video game doesn't mean that you'll actually be able to drive a real car so it's a, it's a all together different experience and yeah you can say that you know because i have driven a car on uh, on a video game i have some understanding of you know uh, some of some of the concepts of driving but it's quite different yeah uh, yeah rohit is back <laughs> hi rohit <laughs> yeah so i was taking the question as you, we lost you the question right. was how different is mooting and actually doing litigation so i said that you know it's like driving a car and driving a car in a video game oh that was the context is it acha i just uh, you know i think i jumped in when the last <laughs> i when i heard the last sentence of yours yeah so how different is mooting and uh, first and foremost i think the drafting the drafting differs weirdly immensely uh, i don't think even it's even remotely connected uh, because obviously you know in order to uh, sort of add to the aesthetic embodiment of our memorials we have the tendency of putting in as many case laws our footnotes at times are longer than the you know the length of our arguments so that show doesn't happen in real life the drafting is going to be absolutely different it's much more crisp it's uh, much more defined it's much more to the point of course needless to say in real life you are bound you are uh, you are confined to the actual happenings so you have to state them the way it is you can't add something because maybe in a moot court the judge may at best tell you no this wasn't a part of you know your moot problem i can't take that into consideration while in real life you adding something especially to the facts of your matter will end up being as misleading the court so that is one thing uh, you know we all need to take into uh, consideration that yes uh, it differs it differs big time then again uh, in real life uh, it's it's very crisp of course the kind of arguments 
uh, the length of them differs big time in supreme court on a miscellaneous day uh, you know a council of my age i think the luckiest one would be getting say a minute the luckiest one or say about 30 40 seconds in high court it may give you a little more time uh, in lower court of course depending Rohit, we are losing you again. There's some problem with your signal, I think. We're losing you again. Rohit, we are losing you. We can't hear anything you're saying. Come to the. We can't hear Rohit. Unfortunately, there's some problem. Yeah. Rohit, we can't hear you. So, unfortunately, we're not able to hear Rohit at all. Uh, he was giving like really amazing insights, but unfortunately, it's kind of not working. Uh, Rohit, are you there? Okay, we do not have Rohit. Uh, we have lost him. So let's just continue uh, with the like. There's nothing to actually like really continue anymore. We have reached the end with the fag end of this discussion. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And unfortunately, we lost to it towards the end. We couldn't hear. He was sharing some amazing insights, but it was a real big problem. And uh, no worries. I think we had a quite productive session. We learned a lot from Rohit about mooting and about litigating both. And we would definitely like to call him back another time. Thank you, everyone. I'm ending this broadcast. And uh, thank you for joining. Hope to see you tomorrow again. We have a very interesting topic. Do join us at 8 p.m. sharp. Thank you very much. Bye. Good night.